Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's lecture on anticoagulant. Let, let us look at the contents for today. Uh, today, we'll be discussing about blood coagulation, the coagulation factors, the coagulation cascade, what are coagulants, the drugs that are used to reduce blood clotting, and then we'll move on to our major topics for today, which is anticoagulants, heparin and related drugs, warfarin, novel oral anticoagulants, and XA inhibitors or factor 10A inhibitors. Okay, so this chart gives you the picture of blood clotting phases, right? Um, we can see that there are four different phases when it comes to blood clotting. The first being the vascular phase, the second platelet phase, the third being the coagulation phase, and the fourth being the fibrinolytic phase. So vascular phase. The vascular phase starts when there is injury to the lining of the blood vessels, and this injury to the to the lining of the blood vessels causes as a constriction so as to decrease the blood oozing out from the wound. This is called the vascular phase. And during the injury to the lining of the blood vessels, the collagen fiber is exposed and the platelets, they release chemicals so as to make the nearby platelet sticky. This platelet, this sticky platelets, they come together and they, they form a plug. This is known as the platelet plug. And this is what the platelet phase constitutes. The third phase of the coagulation phase is when the platelet fa factor from the platelets and the tissue factor from the damaged tissue cells, they come together with calcium and other clotting factors in blood plasma to form blood coagulation or blood clots. The last phase out here is the fibrinolytic phase in which the fibrin clot that has already been formed will be finally broken down by the action of plasminogen which converts into plasmin and then the converted plasmin or the active form of plasmin then helps break down the, the fibrin further. This is called fibrinolytic phase or the thrombolytic phase. Okay, now we come to the next part called coagulation factors. You all might have already learned the various coagulation factors, right? But then today we'll be talking about not just the coagulation factors, but then we'll also be talking about the coagulation factors in relation with the target for, for action of various drugs. When it comes to various anticoagulant drugs, we already discussed that there's heparin, warfarin, then there are direct XA inhibitors, and then there are direct thrombin inhibitors, right? So let us start with heparin. Heparin basically acts on factor 10E and XA, and then it inactivates them through activation of antithrombin 3. Similarly, apart from factor, apart from the inactivation of factor 2A and factor 10A, it also helps inactivate the factors 9, 11, and 12. Warfarin, which is also called the vitamin K antagonist of VKA, it hinders the synthesis of the factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. So heparin, it basically acts to inactivate the fat clotting factors, whereas warfarin, it basically hinders the synthesis of the clotting factors. So the action of heparin is far quicker as compared to warfarin because heparin causes the inactivation of the factors that are already present, while warfarin will just hinder the synthesis of the new clotting factors. Thereby, if a quick action is required, then heparin is almost the first choice among this, the two of them. Then we also have new classes of agents called direct thrombin inhibitors, which act directly on thrombin. They may be either parenteral, like herodine or leperidine, and the oral form as well, dabigatran. Dabigatran was recently uh, discovered in 2010. Then there are, there are another class of drugs called XA inhibitors or factor 10A inhibitors. They inhibit factor 10A directly and they are epixaban, rivaroxaban like drugs. Okay, have a look at this coagulation cascade. When you are looking at this coagulation cascade, right, what you can see is that here is an activation of coagulation cascade and the cascade of events follows, right? And this is anticoagulation pathway where protein C, plasmin, and antithrombin are related. They all cause anticoagulation, okay? When it comes to coagulation cascade, there, there is contact activation and intrinsic pathway, right? Which involves 12, 11, 9, and 10, and 8 as well, right? And then there is another pathway called extrinsic pathway where Tissue factor activation is there and thromboplastin is activated. It works on to activate seven, right? Factor seven, 
and thromoplasty itself is factor three, factor three and seven they start, and then from ten, all of them have got common pathway. Okay, antithrombin is something that is present normally in our body, and it works mainly by inhibiting factor ten A and two A. So heparin basically acts by increasing the activity of antithrombin. Heparin is known to be the cofactor in the step of antithrombin actions, right? In inactivation of in inhibition of factor 10A and 2. Likewise, it also inhibits 7A, 9A, 11A, and 12A. Similarly, there is another class called activated protein, uh, protein C with on activation. It is known to inhibit 8A and 5A side by side. Okay. And plasminogen gets converted into plasmin, and this is known to inhibit the clot formation. This we'll be dealing with in a class called thrombolytics later on. Okay, we just said, talked about heparin and the antithrombin, right? So let us have a look at antithrombin. Antithrombin is a endogenous anticoagulant. It is a member of serine protease inhibitor and it inactivates the serine proteases like 2A, 9A, 10A, 11A, and 12A. Antithrombin 3 typically degrades the thrombin factor 10 and several other factors. The drugs that act on antithrombin, like heparin and heparin substitutes, they are known to increase the action of antithrombin 3 by 10,000 by 1,000 fold. The combination of antithrombin 3 with unfractionated heparin or UFH, it increases the degradation of, factor, of both factor 10A and thrombin. But then along with heparin, I just said that heparin and heparin-like drugs, right? So there are low molecule weight heparin, which we call LMWH, and there is heparin-like drug called fondaparinux. They, they also act on the same antithrombin 3, right? But they are more selective for degradation of XA only. They don't act on other factors. And there are endogenous anticoagulants like protein C and protein S, which attenuate the blood clotting cascade by proteolyzing of factors of 5 and 8A. Here, A refers to the activated form of the clotting factor, okay? Now, this is it. another picture. Have a look at it. Here is the intrinsic pathway, and here is the extrinsic pathway. We said earlier that VTA refers to warfarin or vitamin K antagonist, right? And vitamin K antagonist is known to inhibit the factor 2, 9, 7, and 10. Uh, VKA, this extrinsic pathway, it is, known, it is known as the main initiator of blood coagulation in vivo, right? And on activation of 10, then it converts prothrombin into thrombin, and this converts fibrinogen into fibrin. Again, XA, this direct, direct 10A, factor 10A inhibitor as well, right? Rivaroxaban, epixaban, idoxaban, and recently a new drug, adnexanet, adnexanet alpha has been FDA approved, and this is known to be the, this is known to reverse the effects of this, epixaban and idoxaban, okay? Uh, the main problem with anticoagulants is that there is bleeding as a major problem, right? So if you need to cut down the bleeding right away, if there is an emergency need to cut down the bleeding, then you need to, you need different kind of reversal agents. So here we said vitamin KA antagonist for warfarin, right? So if you need a reversal agent for warfarin, you are going to use vitamin K because we just said warfarin is vitamin K antagonist. So if you give vitamin K, you can reverse the effect, okay? Similarly, in case of rivaroxaban, epixaban, and idoxaban, you can give a new drug that has been that was recently discovered in 2018, and exanate alpha. Similarly, with dabigatran, which is direct thrombin inhibitor, you can give drug called idarucizumab. This idarucizumab was also recently discovered or recently FDA approved in 2015. So far, I guess you are clear on it. Right? Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about coagulants. Coagulants are the substances which promote coagulation, right? They are indicated in hemorrhagic states and clotting factor deficiency states are breast treated with fresh whole blood or plasma. Coagulants, though we know as such, we try not using coagulants or reversal agents so much, and we rather try using fresh whole blood or plasma 
right? And that that is because we don't want coagulation to happen within the body system. That's why when we try and reverse the effect of warfarin, right? We said that vitamin K is there. We said that there are other agents that can reverse, but then so far it's still fresh whole blood or plasma is preferred as yes, reversing agent. Okay, vitamin K, vitamin K1, K2, tranexamic acid, ethanthylate, desmopressin, these are all drugs used for coagulation purpose and we'll be dealing with coagulants and other drugs called skeptics in a different class. Okay, now let, let us have a look at the drugs that are used to reduce clotting. Earlier, one of you said that, okay, the antiplatelet drug, aspirin is also used, right? So I said, the aspirin falls under antiplatelet agent. So there are three major classes of drugs. One is the anticoagulant, right? They are further subdivided into parenteral and oral. Then there is antiplatelet drug, and then there is thrombolytic drug. The prototype of anticoagulant parenteral kind is heparin. In oral, it's warfarin. Antiplatelet, what is aspirin, and thrombolytic drug is streptokinase. Thrombolytic is used once the thrombus is already formed, right? If the thrombus is already formed, we need to break down the thrombus. So we call that kind of drug thrombolytic. Antiplatelet interferes with the platelet plug formation or does not let the platelets come together. So we call it antiplatelet. And anticoagulants, they act through other different pathways that we just discussed or we'll be discussing in much detail now. Okay, with regards to the history of anticoagulants, Warfarin has been the drug of choice for the prevention and treatment of arterial and venous thromboembolic disorders, right, for more than 50 years. And this was initially marketed as a pesticide against rats and mice. And it is still, it is still popular for the purpose. We can have a look at this in a nature video at the end. Uh, heparin and warfarin are regarded as the two traditional anticoagulants drugs. And they are used for various acute coronary syndromes, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, heart surgery. Right? And it can be given to certain people at risk for forming blood clots, like people who have got artificial heart valves and who have atrial fibrillation. Okay, have a look at this picture. Right? Here, what is happening is that hemostatic plug is forming upon injury, but then Along with this plug being formed at, on the outer end, there can also be another thrombus that is formed inside the blood vessel. And this thrombus, when it gets dislodged from this point, right, it can travel to any part of the body, leading to either stroke, right, pulmonary embolism, and then myocardial infarction and deep vein thrombosis. So any kind of thromboembolic disorders can happen as a result of this thrombus traveling to different parts of the body. Okay, now anticoagulant drugs. Anticoagulant drugs, they, they prevent the development of harmful clots in the blood vessels, blood vessels by lessening the blood's ability to cluster together. But they do not form the already formed clots, right, for which we'll need thrombolytic or fibrinolytic drugs. Okay, now let us start with heparin. Heparin is a naturally occurring anticoagulant that is produced in the basophils and mast cells in order to prevent the formation and, and extension of the blood clots. It is de derived from bovine and porcine in intestinal mucosa. The, the heparin that is, that is obtained from porcine in intestinal mucosa is considered to be superior as compared to the one that is obtained from bovine intestinal mucosa. Here, bovine means cows, buffaloes, right? And porcine comes from pig. Heparin does not disintegrate the clots that has already been formed. We just said that we need thrombolytics or fibrinolytics for that kind of activity, right? But however, it permits the natural clot lysis mechanisms like fibrinolysis to break down the previously formed clots. Okay, now looking at the, at the mechanism of action of heparin. We said that there is antithrombin that is present in our body normally, right? And we also mentioned earlier that heparin, it works as a cofactor to increase the activity of antithrombin. So heparin's biological activity is dependent on endogenous coagulant antithrombin. Antithrombin basically inhibits the clotting factor proteases like thrombin 2, thrombin or 2A, and 9A, 10A. And this, this is done by forming ecomolar stable complexes with them. The active heparin molecule, what it does is it tightly binds to antithrombin and causes a conformational change in the inhibitor. 
So this conformational change exposes the active site for rapid interaction with the proteases. So heparin, it only acts as a cofactor. And in absence of heparin, the, these reactions occur very slowly. But in presence of heparin, they, can, they are up to a thousand times faster. So the mechanism for low dose is inactivation of factor 10 and inhibits the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. Right? And the mechanism of at high dose is it also inhibits factor 9, 11, and 12 apart from 10A and thrombin. It also it is also known to inhibit the conversion of fibrin to fibrin, and it inhibits the activation of fiber factor 8 as well. Okay, now moving on to the uses. Heparin is used in the beginning of anticoagulant treatment because its effects are rapid. I said earlier when we were talking about the blood clotting factors, right? Warfarin is known to block the synthesis of the clotting factors, so the effect starts slowly. So heparin, because it deals with inactive causes, the inactivation of the clotting factors, the effects are rapid out here. It is used in deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism to decrease the incidence of recurrent thromboembolic episodes prophylactically in order to prevent the post operative venous thrombosis in acute phase of acute myocardial infarction. It is also used in extracorporeal devices like dialysis machines in order to prevent thrombosis. It is known as drug of choice for treating the pregnant woman with venous embolism because it does not cross placenta. And heparin is safe in pregnancy. We said that warfarin is a one safe one, right? So heparin is safe in pregnancy. However, it should be discontinued at least 24 hours before to delivery in order to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Okay, heparin is given by injection or drip into a vein or subcutaneously for both prevention and treatment. Uh, it is given as infusion by a syringe pump at the rate of 20, 25,000 to 30,000 units in 24 hours following an initial bolus dose of 5,000 units. If the syringe pump is not available, then it is added to a liter of saline of 5% dextrose and given as infusion. In order to prevent thrombosis, heparin is given 5,000 units in 0.2 ml subcutaneously twice daily. Okay, now coming to adverse effects of heparin. The adverse effect of heparin is it causes bleeding, right? With all the anticoagulants, the main side effect has been bleeding, right? It is minimized through patient sele selection and close monitoring of APTT. And elderly women and patients with renal failure, they are known to be more prone. It is known to cause heparin induced thrombocytopenia. It is a systemic hypercoagulable state and it is known to occur in one to four percent of individuals that are treated with unfractionated heparin for. Up to seven days, and the surgical patients are at greater risk. The reported incidence of SRT is lower in case of pediatric population, and it is also relatively rare in pregnant women. However, the risk is higher in individuals if treated with unfractionated heparin of bovine origin. We said earlier that the heparin of porcine origin is relatively better to bovine origin, and this is the same reason. And this is lower with low molecular weight heparin. The antibody that forms to heparin bound plasma uh, platelet factor 4 it causes clamping of the platelets and this is known to decrease the platelets in the blood circulation thereby cause thrombocytopenia okay apart from uh, heparin induced thrombocytopenia there is others like alopecia and allergy osteoporosis bone fractures mineralocorticoid insufficiency and change in liver function test okay so when is heparin contraindicated? It is contraindicated in case of hypersensitive patients, patients having bleeding disorder, alcoholics, and people who have had surgery of brain, eye, and spinal cord. So with, along with heparin comes new class of drugs called low molecular weight heparin. Okay, it is not so new, but then it's relatively new as compared to the old heparin. Uh, low molecular weight heparin is gradually replacing heparin for most of the patients with venous thromboembolism and acute coronary syndromes because it is more convenient and cost effective. It is more convenient in that you don't need constant monitoring of the patient. It has more, it has similar results to heparin and it is it can be administered by subcutaneous injection. Uh, the low molecular weight heparin preparations are inoxaparin, daltiparin, nadroparin, reviparin. These are different forms. Okay. Then there is another 
Heterosynthetic heparin derivative called fondaparin ox. It is given sub it is given by injection once daily, right? And the initial treatment of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism can be done with fondaparin ox. For venous thromboembolism, pre prevention in patients undergoing surgery for hip fracture and hip and knee replacement, fondaparin ox is preferred. Now let us have a look at what are the differences between this this heparin low molecule weight heparin and fondaparin ox. All of these they are known to bind to antithrombin and activate it, thereby increase the activity of antithrombin A. Okay, three. Uh, but heparin on binding to antithrombin three, it inactivates the factor 10A and thrombin, whereas low molecular weight heparin and fondaparinox they selectively inhibit the or inactivate the factor 10A. Low molecular weight heparin is known to have less effect on inactivation of thrombin and fondaparinox. It is not, not known to bind to any other plasma proteins. Okay, have a look at this chart again, which shows the difference between the different drugs. This is not so important to remember as such totally, right? But then I want you guys to have a look at this. We said earlier that reversal agent is especially important when it comes to anticoagulants, right? Because a person can bleed very uh, profuse amounts of blood. So you need reversal agent at any time. Uh, protamine sulfate is known to be the best reversal agent when it comes to heparin. But let's see, protamine sulfate, it can only neutralize 60% of activity of low molecule weight heparin. And in case of fondaparin ox, uh, we don't have any reversal agent as such. So pro prothrombin complex concentrate is used as a reversal agent. Uh, Will not, not be discussing into the details for now. The other details. Heparinoids are glycosamines with the derivatives of heparin. They include the oligosaccharides and sulfated polysaccharides of plant, animal, and synthetic origin. They may be heparin sulfate, danaparoid, leperidine, and crude like drugs. Okay. Heparin sulfate is a heparin like natural substance that is found in cell surface and intracellular matrix. It is less potent anticoagulant as compared to. Heparin, but it is it has favorable profile action. Danaparoid, it's main it mainly contains heparin sulfate and it is obtained from pig gut mucosa. It is used in cases of heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Then comes leperidin. Okay, leperidin is parenteral direct thrombin inhibitor. Both hirudin and leperidin are basically the parent parenteral direct thrombin inhibitor. Hirudin is something that is obtained from the leech. If some of you have been beaten by le leech at any time, then what you remember, what you can recall is that the part where the leech bites you, right? You've got this sort of cut, uh, which is uh, quite like the symbol of Mercedes-Benz car, actually. Okay, there is a cut in the center, and then there are three parts. There are three cuts that go from the center at 120 degree angle each right and the place where the leech bites you see that the they constant bleeding even after the leech has left right this is because the leech has got hirudin in its saliva and that hirudin prevents the clotting of the blood so this same thing is brought into clinical use right this same like effect is brought into clinical use but then because you don't find leads so commonly, so you are going to use the recombinant preparation and you are going to use another kind of drug called leperidin. It acts by inhibiting the thrombin directly. It is indicated in patients with heparin induced thrombocytopenia. If you look at leads, you think that leads therapy may not be such a common thing, right? But you can look at even the scientific journals, they have got articles on leads therapeutic applications and they can be used therapeutically. Okay, we said earlier that protamine sulfate is the antagonist for heparin, right? So protamine sulfate is a strongly basic low molecular weight protein that is obtained from the sperm of certain fish. It is given IV to neutralize heparin weight for weight. And when N, one mg of protamine sulfate is given, it, can, it is known to neutralize 1000 units of heparin. In absence of heparin, protamine itself acts as a weak anticoagulant by interacting with platelets and Fibrinogen. It is basically used for the treatment of heparin induced bleeding. However, it is needed infrequently because the action of heparin disappears itself in a few hours and whole blood transfusion is indicated 
to replenish the loss when grading occurs. It is more commonly used when the action is needed to be terminated quickly, like after cardiac surgery and vascular surgery. And because it is basic in nature, it can, re it can release maximum amounts of histamine in the body. So hypersensitivity in the reactions have occurred and rapid IV injection following that leads to flushing and breathing difficulties is noted. So we recently just finished talking about heparin, the heparin derivatives and heparin. Then we talked about low molecular weight heparin and fondaparinus. Right? Now let's move on to the oral anticoagulant drug warfarin. Warfarin basically gets its, gets its name from Wisconsin Alumina Research Foundation plus Arin is added at the end. The first letters WARF stand for Wisconsin Alumina Research Foundation because the, it, is, it was discovered in Wisconsin and there's a, there's a very nice video that is given by Nature Reviews that talks about the history of warfarin. We will be shortly looking at the video. Warfarin has long been used as a rodenticide drug, and this was earlier discovered as a rodenticide itself. Prior to being used as, a, as an oral anticoagulant drug, it was used as a rodenticide, and there is a very nice history behind how come this drug that was used as a rodenticide came into the clinical use. Okay, so what happens is that it was during the mid 1920s in America, basically Wisconsin region, that the farmers who were raising the cattle, their cows, their cattle, they all of a sudden, most of the cattle, they started dying as a result of excessive bleeding. So the, the farmers, they eventually found out that it was the sweet clover, which went morally and it fed to the animals, they led to the death of, death of the animals. So most of the animal farmers, they tried not to give the moldy sweet clover, but then some farmers simply did not have any alternative feed. So they still had to resolve to this moldy sweet clover, but then feeding this moldy sweet clover led to the death of many, many animals. So it was in 1933 that a farmer in Wisconsin had this terrible problem and he could not deal with the problem anymore. So what he does is he takes almost a thousand, a hundred pounds of sweet clover with, with this fungus and a dead cow to the University of Wisconsin to a biochemist out there. And then he pleased the biochemist to look into this, the issue seriously and to find as to what is causing them the problem. So the biochemist at that very time, he doesn't have any clue as to what is causing the trouble, but then he gets his team to work on this thing. And after seven years or so, in 1940, they identify that it is a, a it is warfarin or comarole basically, which was causing, which had an anticoagulant effect and which was implicated in the death of the cow. So after it was implicated in the, in the death of the cow, it was also found that it can be used as a rodenticide to kill the rodents. So it was the use of warfarin became very widely widespread as a rodenticide. And after it's used as a rodenticide, it was also being misused, uh, abused, by the military people who had PTSD disorders who wanted to carry on suicide. But then they, they simply, they took warfarin, but then they didn't die of it. There, was, there were different cases of, of army men who, or policemen or army men who used warfarin for, the, for suicidal purpose, but then did not die of it. So having got this data of death of animals resulting from warfarin intake and no death recorded in humans. This gave an idea to the scientists that, okay, we should use this drug now as an anticoagulant drug, and then we can use it simply because it doesn't cause, uh, cause any problem to the humans while it is, though it, it is toxic to the animals. Uh, they even tried introduce, introducing this drug to the market, but then there was a problem in that the people who were all using this drug as a rodenticide, they didn't want to use a poison as an anticoagulant drug. So it was finding a relatively hard time, hard time in the market when it came to human consumption. In the same time, at around 1953, President Eisenhower needs 
an anticoagulant drug and then his doctors they they explain him quite well that this drug is non-toxic to humans and then can be used in humans and then when president eisenhower he starts taking the drug and then he is all right then then the companies they start to remarket the drug saying that if a drug is good enough for your president it's good enough for you this is how the, the drug which was once used as a rodenticide becomes what what is spread used as a anticoagulant and then this anticoagulant after used in 1950s has been used even till now in 2020 it is still one of the widely used drugs but it has got its own problems with regards to constant need of monitoring because it's a low therapeutic window drug so have a look at the video that is given by the history nature reviews and then we'll move on further this is warfarin one of the world's most widely prescribed drugs it's an anticoagulant which inhibits blood from clotting and is used to prevent and treat stroke heart attacks and deep vein thrombosis so it's a pretty big deal and it all started with some moldy hay and a load of dead cows. The story begins in the Midwest USA. During the 1920s, dairy farmers were losing cow after cow to a strange disease that caused their cattle to bleed to death. Vets soon identified the culprit, a crop in the cattle feed called sweet clover. If it was left to go moldy and fed to cows, it seemed to make them sick, but no one knew why. Unfortunately, few could afford alternative feeds. And so, in the winter of 1933, one desperate farmer, Ed Carlson, made a 200-mile journey to the University of Wisconsin in search of help. In the back of his truck were 100 pounds of sweet clover and a milk can full of blood that wouldn't clot. Oh, and a dead cow. Eventually, he stumbled upon a biochemist called Carl Link and made a plea for help although there was nothing Link could do for Carlson's cows. But this chance meeting would have a profound effect on Link, and he soon set his team on the hunt for the chemical responsible for the sweet clover disease. After seven years of research, they found it, a compound called dicumeral which inhibited blood clotting in a number of animals such as mice and rabbits. In fact, one variant was so potent in rats that they developed it into a rat poison and called it warfarin. Unfortunately for rats, it became one of the most popular rodenticides on the market. Soon, research showed that warfarin could be used safely in humans, but few doctors wanted to prescribe a rat poison. So, when it was approved for clinical use in 1954, it was sold under a different name, Kumadin. In 1955, it was used to treat President Dwight Eisenhower following a heart attack, which helped boost its popularity further. After all, if it was good enough for the most powerful man in the world, it was good enough for everyone else. Fast forward 50 years and other anticoagulant drugs have been developed, but warfarin is still used to treat millions of people. In fact, it remains on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. And all of this down to a chance meeting between a dairy farmer and a determined biochemist. Welcome back. So let us start with warfarin again. Warfarin is basically an oral anticoagulant medication. It is a synthetic derivative of coumarin, a chemical that is naturally found in many plants that decreases blood coagulation, basically by interfering with vitamin K metabolism. Therefore, warfarin is often referred to as BKE or vitamin K antagonist. Warfarin is usually administered as a sodium salt and its viability is almost 100%. It has got high plasma protein binding, about almost 99%, and there is lack of urinary excretion of unsensed drug in that most of the drug gets, gets metabolized in the liver by CYP450 metabolism. The T half of the drug is around 36 hours. Now, looking at the mechanism of action of warfarin, warfarin inhibits the effective synthesis of the biologically active forms of vitamin K dependent clotting factors, and it does so basically by blocking the gamma carboxylation of several glutamate residues that are found in clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, and also in the regulatory factors protein 
T, protein S, and protein Z. It carries on, on in its action basically by blocking the two different enzymes. One is quinone reductase, which is required for vitamin K activation to vitamin K hydroquinone, and two is by blocking the vitamin K epoxide reductase, which is required for the recycling of vitamin K. When it comes to warfarin, warfarin is present as a receiving mixture of R and S warfarin. S warfarin is three to four, five times more potent as compared to R warfarin. Warfarin is an inhibitor to the enzyme vitamin K reductase. It binds to the enzyme in liver cells and consequently inhibits its activity, resulting in a decreased production of the reduced form of vitamin K. This in turn leads to the deactivation of gamma glutamyl carboxylase and consequently impairs the conversion of glutamic acid into gamma carboxyglutamic acid. Finally, this decrease in gamma carboxyglutamic acid suppresses the production of clotting factors that contain the GLA proteins, such as factor 2, 7, 9, factor 10, and protein C and protein S. Now, moving on to the uses of the warfarin. Warfarin is used to stop blood from clotting within the blood vessels. It is used to stop existing clots from getting bigger, as in case of deep vein thrombosis, to stop the parts of clots breaking up and forming emboli, as in the case of pulmonary embolism, and in case of artificial heart bulbs, to stop the formation of blood clots. As I told earlier, that warfarin is a drug which has got narrow therapeutic window, window that, that is why it needs constant monitoring, right? So its doses is something that needs to be monitored on a regular basis. Usually as a dose of warfarin is 5 mg per day for 2 to 4 days, followed by 2 to 10 mg per day, as indicated by the measurements of internationalized, international normal, normalized ratio or INR. The treatment is monitored by regular blood testing using International normalized ratio INR, which is a measure of how much it takes, how much longer it takes for the blood to clot when oral anticoagulant drug is used. INR is calculated by the followed by the given equation, where the prothrombin time of the patient is judged uh, with the prothrombin time of the reference standard and international sensitivity index is brought into consideration. Okay, now let us look into the adverse effects of warfarin. The most common side effects of warfarin are bleeding and bruising. And this is like any other anticoagulant drugs. Bleeding is common with all groups of anticoagulant drugs. The bleeding can be in the form of prolonged bleeding from the cuts to bleeding that it does not stop by itself. Cutaneous necrosis can sometimes be seen in the first week of the therapy, rarely leading to frank infarction of the breast, penis, fat tissues, intestine, and extremities. A reversible, sometimes painful, blue tinge discoloration of the plantar surfaces and sides of the toes that blanches with pressure and feeds with elevation of the legs or pulpit toes syndrome may be seen anywhere from three to eight weeks after the initiation of therapy. There, there may be other infrequent reactions as well, like alopecia, urticaria, dermatitis, fever, nausea, diarrhea, abnormal cramp, and anorexia. Warfarin crosses the placenta readily and can cause hemorrhagic disorder in the fetus. That's why it is contraindicated in pregnancy. It falls in category X when it comes to pregnancy category drugs. The fetal proteins with carboxyglutamate residues, which are found in bone and blood, may be affected. A serious blood birth defect characterized by abnormal bone formation has been noted. It is totally contraindicated in pregnancy and fetal warfarin syndrome or Warfarin embryopathy is a rare condition as a result of fetal exposure to maternal ingestion of warfarin during pregnancy. This is a case report of malformation due to warfarin. You can have a look at the picture as to what are the malformations. Then you can also look, look about the fetal warfarin syndrome in which there are various malformations discussed. 
Okay, there are certain warfarin like drugs in the market, like this hydroxycomarin, which is a dichromarin, and acinocomarin. This hydroxycomarin is slowly and unpredictably absorbed orally. It is metabolized in a dose dependent manner. The T half is prolonged at higher doses. It has got four GI tolerance. The T half of acinocomarin is around eight hours. But since it has got an active metabolite, its T half is prolonged to about 24 hours and it is known to act more rapidly. So this is all about warfarin and warfarin-like drugs. Now let us move on to novel oral anticoagulants. Historically, vitamin K antagonists like warfarin, they have been the standard of care and only oral option. The scientist needed to look for novel oral anticoagulants because warfarin has got a narrow therapeutic window. It requires frequent lab monitoring and is affected by diet, genetic, and illnesses. So the scientists were looking for medications that do not require the same, same sort of frequent monitoring that have got less intra and interpatient variability and could that could offer great potential when it comes to anticoagulation therapy. Basically, the novel oral anticoagulants or NOACs, there are two main classes. One is direct thrombin inhibitors like dabigatran, and the another is direct factor 10A inhibitors. Factor 10A inhibitors includes rivaroxaban, epixaban, and idoxaban like drugs. NOACs have overall similar indications, such as to reduce the risk of stroke and systemic embolism in non vascular valvular atrial fibrillation and to treat and prevent deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. Like all other anticoagulants, their adverse effects is also bleeding. Now, let us have a look at the various antidotes. In the event that the effect of anticoagulant needs to be reversed very fast, we need antidotes, right? So VKEs or vitamin K antagonists can be, can be reversed with vitamin K, fresh frozen, frozen plasma or prothrombin complex concentrate. The reversal agents for NOACs are, are relatively limited because NOACs themselves are relatively new drug class of drugs. Idea Rosizumab is a reversal agent specifically for dabigatran, and this was approved recently in October 2015. A new option for reversing the anticoagulant effect of factor 10 A inhibitors like epixaban and rivaroxaban has been found. This was approved in May 2018, and it comes by the name Andexanate Alpha. Alipazin has also shown promising re results to reverse the effect of low molecular weight heparin, fondaparinox, and direct oral anticoagulants, but is still in development phase. We can find various other articles that say that direct oral anticoagulants, they are safe, and they can be used for, treat for preventing cancer-related venous thromboembolism. Similarly, this is another, another article which says that novel oral anticoagulant is an option for patients with atrial fibrillation. They can be used in case of atrial fibrillation as well. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you. Stay safe.